If People Knew Religion, a sermon by St. John Vianney. Neither wealth nor honors nor vanity can make a man happy during his life on earth, but only attachment to the service of God, when we are fortunate enough to realize that and to carry it out properly. The woman who is held in contempt by her husband is not unhappy in her state because she is held in contempt, but because she does not know her religion, or because she does not practice what her religion tells her she should do. Teach her religion, and from the moment that you see her practice it, she will cease to complain and to consider herself unhappy. Oh, how happy man would be, even on this earth, if he knew his religion! What power that person who is near to God possesses when he loves him and serves him faithfully! Alas, my dear brethren, anyone who is despised by worldly people, who appears to be unimportant and humble, look at him when he masters the very will and power of God himself. Look at Moses, who compels the Lord to grant pardon to three hundred thousand men who were indeed guilty. Look at Joshua, who commanded the sun to stand still and the sun became immobile, a thing which never happened before, and which perhaps will never happen again. Look at the apostles. Simply because they loved God, the devils fled before them, the lame walked, the blind saw, the dead arose to life. Look at St. Benedict who commanded the rocks to stop in their course, and they remained hanging in midair. Look at him who multiplied bread, who made water come out of rocks, and who disposed of the stones and the forest as easily as if they were wisps of straw. Look at St. Francis of Paula, who commands the fish to come to hear the word of God, and they respond to his call, with such loyalty that they applaud his words. Look at St. John, who commands the birds to keep silent, and they obey him. Look at many others who walk the seas without human aid. Very well. Now take a look at all those impious people, and all those famous ones of the world, with all their wit and all their knowledge for achieving everything. Alas, of what are they really capable? Nothing at all. And why not? unless it is because they are not attached to the service of God. But how powerful and how happy at the same time is the person who knows his religion and who practices what it commands. Alas, my dear brethren, the man who lives according to the direction of his passions and abandons the service of God is both unhappy and capable of so little. Put an army of one hundred thousand men around a dead man, and let him employ all their power to bring him back to life. No, no, my dear children, he will not come to life again. But let someone who is despised by the world, who enjoys the friendship of God, command this dead man to take up life again. Immediately you will see him arise and walk. We have other proofs of this, too. If it were necessary to be wealthy or to be very learned to serve God, a great many people would be unable to do it. But no, my dear children, extensive learning or great wealth are not at all necessary for the service of God. On the contrary, they are often a very big obstacle to it. Yes, my dear brethren, let us be rich or poor, in whatever state we may be, learned or otherwise, we can please God and save our souls. Listen to me for one moment, and you will see that only the service of God will console us and make us happy in the midst of all the miseries of life. To accomplish it, you do not need to leave either your belongings or your parents, or even your friends, unless they are leading you to sin. You have no need to go and spend the rest of your lives in the desert to weep there for your sins. If that were necessary for us, indeed, we should be very happy to have such a remedy for our ills. But no, 
a father and a mother of a family, can serve God by living with their children and bringing them up in a Christian way. A servant can very easily serve God and his master, with nothing to stop him. No, my dear brethren, the way of life which means serving God changes nothing in all that we have to do. On the contrary, we simply do better all the things we must do. Thoughts on the Way to Church When our duty calls us to a holy place, might not anyone say that we resemble criminals being led before their judges to be condemned to the worst possible tortures, rather than Christians whom love alone should lead to God? How very blind we are, my dear brethren, to have so little heart for the things of heaven! While at the same time we are so taken up with the things of the world, Indeed, when it is a question of temporal matters, or even of pleasures, everyone will be preoccupied with them. They will think about them in advance. They will meditate upon them. But, unfortunately, when the question is one of the service of our God and the salvation of our poor souls, the whole thing becomes a matter of routine and inconceivable indifference. Suppose someone wants to speak to a very important or influential person and to ask him some favor. He will dwell upon the matter for a long time in advance. He will consult others whom he thinks better educated or more experienced than himself in order to find out in what way he should approach this person. He will appear before him in that modest and respectful bearing which, generally speaking, the presence of such a personage inspires. But when he comes into the house of God, ah, there is no more of that sort of thing. No one thinks then of what he is about to do, or of what he is about to ask of God. Tell me, my dear brethren, who is there who, as he is going along to church, is saying to himself, Where am I going? Is it to the house of man or to the palace of a king? Oh no, it is into the house of my God, into the dwelling place of him who loves me more than himself, since he died for me, whose compassionate eyes are aware of my actions, whose ears are attentive to my prayers, always ready to hear my prayers and to forgive. Filled with these blessed thoughts, why would we not exclaim with the holy King David, O oh my soul, rejoice that you are about to enter the house of the Lord. To give him your homage, to show him your needs, to listen to his divine words, to ask him for his graces. O oh, what things I have to say to him, what graces I have to ask of him, what gratitude I have to pay him. I will speak to him of all my worries, and I know that he will console me. I will admit my faults to him, and he will forgive me. I am going to talk to him of my family, and he will bless it with all sorts of mercies. Yes, my God, I shall adore you in your holy temple, and I shall return from there filled with all sorts of benedictions. Tell me, my dear brethren, is that the sort of thought which occupies you when your religious duties call you to church? Are those indeed the thoughts you have, after having wasted the entire morning in discussing your sales and your purchases, or, at the least, some other entirely useless matter? You come along in a hurry to hear a Mass, which often is half-finished. Alas! If I dare to put into words how many go to visit the God of drunkenness before their Creator, and coming to church full of wine, they will talk and concern themselves with temporal matters right up to the very door. O oh, dear God, are these Christians who ought to be living like angels upon earth? What of you, my good woman? Are your thoughts any better now that you have occupied your mind and part of your time in thinking how you were going to dress, so that you might please the people you know, 
and then you come to a place where you should come only to lament for your sins. Indeed, too often the priest is ascending the altar while you are still turning around and around, looking at yourself in front of a mirror. Ah, dear God, are these really Christians who have taken you for their model? You, whose whole life was spent amidst scorn and tears. Listen, my dear young lady, to what St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, has to teach you. As he was in the doorway of the church one day, and saw a young person approaching dressed with the greatest of care, he spoke to her. "'Where are you going, young woman?' he asked. She told him that she was going to church. "'You are going to the church,' the holy bishop said to her. "'But one might rather think that you are going to the dance or to a play or a spectacle.' "'Go away, sinful woman, and weep for your sins in secret.' and do not come to the church to insult with your frivolous adornments a crucified God. How many people, when they are coming to the church, think of nothing else except themselves and their clothes and styles? They enter the temple of the Lord, saying from the depths of their hearts, Have a look at me. When we see such wrong dispositions, how can we help but shed tears? And you, Fathers and mothers, what are your dispositions when you come to church, to the Mass? Alas, we must admit it with sorrow, that most frequently the fathers and mothers that we see are coming into the church when the priest is already on the altar, or even in the pulpit. Ah, you will tell me, we came as soon as we could. We have other things to do. Undoubtedly, you have other things to do. But I know very well, too, that if you did not leave until Sunday the one hundred and one things in your homes which you should have done on Saturday, and if you had gotten up a little earlier in the morning, you would have done them all before Holy Mass, and you would have arrived at the church before the priest had ascended the altar. It can be the same thing, too, with your children and your servants. If you had not been giving them orders until the very last stroke of the mass bell, they would have arrived at the church at the beginning. I do not know whether God will receive all these excuses easily. I hardly think so. But why, my dear children, should I speak of particular cases? Surely it is that the majority of you behave in this way. Yes. When you are called to church so that the graces of God may be administered to you, anyone may see this lack of enthusiasm in you, this indifference, this boredom which consumes you, this practically general inattention. Tell me, where will you see the majority of the general congregation when the services are beginning? Are the vespers not half said by the time you arrive? We have work to do, you tell me. Well, my friends, if you were to tell me that you have neither faith nor love of God nor the desire to save your poor souls, I would believe you much better. Alas, what can anyone think of all that? There is a great deal to lament in what is to be seen of the dispositions of the majority of Christians. A great many of them seem to come to church only in spite of themselves, or, if I dare to put it that way, as if someone were dragging them there. From the house to the church, temporal matters only are discussed. A group of young girls together will talk about nothing except style, beauty, and all the rest of it. The young men only of games and amusements, or other matters which are more evil. The fathers or the masters of households will chat about their property or business, about buying and selling. The mothers are preoccupied only with their households and their children. No one will go so far as to deny that. Alas, not a single thought will be given to the happiness they are about to have, not a single reflection on the needs of their poor souls or those of their children or their servants. They enter the holy temple without respect, without attention, and a great many of them as late as is possible. 
How many others do not even go to the trouble of coming in at all, but stay outside in order to find better ways of distracting themselves? The word of God does not trouble their consciences. They look around at those who are coming and going. Dear God, are these really the Christians for whom you suffered so much in order to make them happy? And this is all they think of it. With dispositions like that, how many sins must be committed during the services? How many people must commit more sins on Sunday than during all the rest of the week? Listen to what St. Martin has to tell us. While he was singing the Mass with St. Bryce, his disciple, he noticed the latter smiling. After it was all over, he asked him what had made him smile. St. Bryce replied, Father, I saw something extraordinary while we were singing the Holy Mass. Behind the altar I saw a devil, and he was writing on a huge sheet of parchment the sins which were being committed in the church. And his sheet was rather full before the Mass was finished. So the devil took the sheet of the parchment between his teeth and tugged it so hard that he tore it into shreds. That's what made me smile. What sins, and even mortal sins, we commit during the services by our lack of devotion and recollection. Alas, what has become of those happy times when Christians passed not only the day, but even the greater part of the nights in church, mourning for their sins and singing the praises of God? See, even in the Old Testament, see Holy Anna and the Prophetess, who withdrew into a tribune in order to leave the service of God no more. Look at the holy old man Simeon. See again Zachary and so many others who passed the greater portion of their lives in the service of the Lord. And note, too, how marvelous and how precious were the graces which God bestowed upon them. To reward Anna, God willed that she should be the very first to recognize our Lord. The holy old man Simeon was also the first, after St. Joseph, to have the happiness, the very great happiness, of holding the Savior of the world in his arms. The holy Zachary was chosen to be the father of a child destined to be the ambassador of the Eternal Father in announcing the coming of his Son into the world. What wonderful graces does God not grant to those who make it their duty to come to visit him in his holy temple as much as they possibly can. Welcome to the Virgo Potens YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, give it a like. I also invite you to subscribe to this channel so that you won't miss new content please prayerfully consider supporting my work by becoming a patron of Virgo Potens on Patreon and or by buying one of my books. My ebooks are available on Amazon as well as on the Apple Bookstore. For those who prefer a physical copy rather than an ebook, my book Spiritual Warfare Know Thy Enemy is also available as a paperback on Amazon. If you are interested in making a one-time contribution, I suggest that you do so by simply buying one of my books. I am thankful for your support. Links to Patreon and to my books will be posted in the comments section of this video. The continuation of this work isn't possible without you. Lastly, and most importantly, please pray for me. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you.